Good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Clifford Chung. I'm an assistant professor of theoretical physics here at Caltech. It's, great, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first, spec, uh, first speaker of uh, the morning session, David Gross. Uh, David is the Chancellor's Chair Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and also the former director of the esteemed Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. So uh, David is renowned in the field uh, for numerous seminal uh, contributions to elementary particle physics and also string theory. His work on the strong interactions, also known as quantum chromodynamics, is now a cornerstone of the modern standard, mo the standard model of physics, which describes the world. Uh, for this work, he was awarded a Nobel Prize, which he shared with Frank Wilczek and our own David Politzer here at Caltech. Uh, he uh, was also an early pioneer and discoverer of string theory and remains to this day uh, an active leader at the forefront of uh, uh, the most recent developments in theoretical physics. So please join me in welcoming David, who will tell us about the future of particle physics. So it's really a great pleasure and honor to be here at celebrating Feynman's 100th birthday. Uh, yesterday, I'm sure you were all there last night, uh, was absolutely spectacular. Congratulations to the organizers. It's a wonderful evening. Uh, I don't think there's any way we can surpass that today. <laughs> I feel rather humble. Uh, Feynman was an amazing physicist, an amazing teacher. He inspired many people from all over, not necessarily physicists, but for physicists of my generation, he was, he was a, a model uh, in many ways and an inspiration. Um, he was, of course, a, as many have said, a magician, a magical physicist of the highest caliber uh, whose contributions to science are truly amazing and, and, and beautiful and fun. He um, was a great performer. He was a celebrity. A uh, physicist, a great communicator, an inspired teacher. But uh, for many of us, he sort of he taught us many lessons about how to approach science and how to think about the real world. Uh, these messages that were shown last night on his blackboard, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, and you really have to, and he tried, I guess, to solve every problem that, to learn how to solve every problem that has ever been solved are really inspirational. I don't think any of us can really live up to that, but it is an inspiration. But there's another thing which uh, he sort of taught my generation, which is very valuable, which is a very healthy disrespect for authority <laughs> and a total aversion to bullshit. And, uh, it really changed the way theoretical physicists behave, I think, in a profound way. Uh, everyone, to some extent, tried to emulate Feynman's joy and passion for physics, uh, to disrespect authority, which is especially pleasant when you're young, and, and an aversion uh, to bullshit, which would be very healthy uh, in today's world. <laughs> he also taught us how to visualize physics. I mean, um, he taught us, with his famous Feynman diagrams, how to think about how to see, how to feel uh, what elementary particles are doing as described by quantum field theory. Uh, I remember when I first studied quantum field theory, a course from Steve Weinberg, he went into the class, wrote on the blackboard, field theory equals Feynman diagrams. And for a long time, and still today, even though it's only really a perturbative approach, a weak coupling approach to quantum field theory, it dominates the way we think about particles and forces and how to calculate. Feynman loved to calculate. His most important contribution, in my view, was uh, the reformulation of quantum mechanics, his thesis, or came out of his thesis project, uh, to uh, picture, to describe 
quantum mechanical amplitudes whose squares give probabilities of, say, well, how you calculate the probability if a particle is at point A at time zero, it'll be at point B at time t, by summing over all paths from A to B, weighted by a phase factor, which uh, the mathematical formula is given here. But, uh, but thinking about quantum mechanics as a sum over histories uh, <laughs> gave us both an, a, 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 a very important calculational tool, a formulation that led to many, many applications and new methods in quantum field theory and in quantum mechanics, but also a totally different and geometrical and deep um, way of thinking about quantum mechanics. So this year, indeed, is the 100th uh, birthday of Richard Feynman. So we celebrate uh, occasions like this which have zeros. Uh, it's also, you know, remarkably, the 50th, by some counting, uh, birth of the standard model of particle physics, to which Feynman made important contributions. A <coughs> uh, standard model, you know, could be dated, could be 51 years, could be 45 years old. In any case, it's close to 50, and there are going to be many celebrations of the standard model over the next few years. So I thought it would be appropriate to, um, in this very brief talk, discuss the future of particle physics, which although, you know, Feynman was interested in everything, and one of the important things he taught us was that everything in nature is fascinating, especially if you really get into the details and try to understand how it works and calculate. But his, perhaps his, his primary interest was the, the physics of elementary particles and how they interact. And uh, the standard model, which is now 50 years old, half of Feynman's life, uh, is our current theory of elementary particles, which have been identified the last uh, 100 years as quarks and leptons, electrons, and, and two kinds of up and down quarks inside ordinary nuclei and atoms and two other families, three families of quarks and leptons. And more importantly, we understand in great detail the forces that act on these particles, the force of electromagnetism, whose carrier is the electromagnetic field, or the particle of light, the photon, uh, the strong nuclear force that is carried by it gluons and acts on quarks and uh, binds them permanently within nucleons and nuclei. And finally, the weak nuclear force that acts on quarks and leptons, turning uh, one kind of quark into another, or an electron into a neutrino. Together with a, a Higgs field, which is been added to this framework to break the electroweak symmetry. Uh, we have the essence of the standard model, to which Feynman made very important contributions. Of course, the theory, uh, the quantized theory of electromagnetism, quantum electrodynamism, which he and Schwinger, Tomonaga, Dyson, was the first um, formulation of a quantum field theory, which agreed with the experiment and gave the whole found, the foundation for our basic tool in fundamental physics, quantum field theory. He also made major contributions to the electro to the weak study of the weak force, um, in particular with Murray Gelman understanding the chiral or left-handed nature of the of the uh, weak force. This is an amazingly successful theory. It, as far as we could tell, as far as we can tell by extrapolating, could work down to extraordinarily short distances. 
uh, the famous Planck scale. And uh, as far as we can tell, it works out to the edge of the universe, explaining the structure of, of nuclei, atoms, molecules, stars, galaxies. You, of course, have to add to this these three fundamental forces, uh, Einstein's theory of classical theory of gravity. This is much more than a model. It's really a theory. You can tell it's a theory because you can put the equations or the principle, in this case, the action, um, that determines how to weight different paths of quantum fields <coughs> on one t-shirt. And if you add Einstein's contribution, you have a rather complete, with a few parameters, description, as far as we can tell, ju of just about everything that we've ever measured and continue to measure. And in a absurdly reductionist sense, if you start with the uh, equations that follow from this action, uh, with a lot of work and powerful computers, we believe you could calculate the results just about, just about everything. Not everything, but just about everything that we have observed or continue to measure. Unbelievably successful. Uh, I hope very much that at the 50th anniversary, we will call, start calling this the standard theory. It's by far the best theory physics has ever had. Now, I could go on for the rest of the talk describing how well it works. I'll just give a few slides. Feynman, when the standard model um, emerged in the 1970s, Feynman leapt in. He made important contributions to its development, but when it, <coughs> but he was obsessed with calculating cross sections like this using. Uh, originally very simple ideas, uh, but then QCD. And uh, I think he would have been astonished and pleased at this incredible agreement with experiment over you know, 24 orders of magnitude of cross-section. This requires the kind of exquisite control that Feynman always sought to be able, from the theory to calculate with high precision. And of course, it's a, an amazing experimental uh, triumph to be able to, to measure these cross-sections with such incredible accuracy. There's one more. This is quite amazing. These are cross-sections for jet production and the collision of protons uh, at energies up to a TV, you see here at the LHC. Feynman uh, once gave a beautiful summary of physics. He, he wondered if in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge was destroyed and one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, cockroaches, who knows, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words. And he said, well, that's probably the atomic hypothesis or fact, um, whatever you want to call it, that all things are made of atoms, little particles, and move around in perpetual motion, uh, attracting each other when they're close, but repelling each other when squeezed into one another. And you know, a lot of physics and a Feynman could explain a hell of a lot, starting from this sentence. Um, so I, I tried to, I wonder what, whether we could boil the standard theory down to one sentence. I found that impossible, but I do think if we, one slide, we can summarize what we've learned from the standard model. So matter consists of charged spin one half particles. Those are the quarks and leptons. Uh, the forces are described by quantum field theory based on local symmetries of nature, gauge theories. And there are three kinds of charges. There are particles like 
some of the quarks and leptons that have electric charge and they're described by electromagnetism, a U1 gauge theory. And <coughs> that force exhibits a, what we call a Coulomb phase, long range interactions, forces that fall off like the inverse square of the distance. Then there are some of the particles, the quarks, well, actually all of the particles, quarks and leptons have uh, weak charges. We call them flavor, two charges now. And their forces acting on those charges are described by a non-abelian, an SU2 uh, gauge theory. And what we see in nature is that that force is screened, extremely screened, or Higgs. And we achieve that somewhat, uh, unfortunately, by a rather unnatural scalar field sector introduced to uh, screen that charge, resulting in a very short range uh, interaction. And finally, the quarks have three other charges called colors. And th those forces are described by a SU3 gauge theory. Uh, but it, it, it uh, shows another phase uh, in which the forces are anti-screen. They get bigger and bigger uh, at, as you pull the quarks apart. And thereby, the color charges are permanently confined inside, neutra, inside neutral uh, nucleons. That's a, that's a standard model. And I have a feeling it took a long time to understand this. Uh, sorry. It took a long time to understand this, partly because some of these phases are so different than electromagnetism. And the charges, especially the strong charges, are confined and therefore not apparent. <coughs> but being presented with such a slide, I'm sure Feynman in 1950 could have worked out the standard theory in a few weeks. Uh, among these elements of the standard model, there's my favorite, QCD, uh, which, aside from describing the nuclear physics with, uh, and behavior of quarks with great precision, gives us an example of what we should ultimately aim for I call a perfect theory. Uh, because if we ignore the quarks, uh, which makes life easier, or sit, set their masses to zero, which changes very little in nuclear physics, uh, one, there are no infinities in any case, but also there are no adjustable parameters. Uh, QCD without quarks or massless quarks, uh, everything is calculable, all dimensionless numbers. And there's no new physics, no matter how high energy or short distance you go. Um, how is that? Well, in quantum chromodynamics, you go to very short distances, the coupling vanishes. That's asymptotic freedom. And the only way you ever find infinities, the kind of infinities that plague the inventors of quantum field theory, the kind of infinities that were dealt with by uh, Feynman and his friends formulating QED, renormalization theory, uh, don't appear unless you try to express uh, observables at finite distances in terms of those measured infinitely small distances. But if you write down the answer, Feynman's path integral for QCD, this is actually how one does numerical calculations in QCD. Uh, no infinities ever appear. You put the theory on a lattice in terms of a coupling, uh, which the theory tells you how to adjust as you let the lattice spacing go to zero to get a continuum theory. And at no stage do any infinities ever occur. Uh, second of all, there are no adjustable parameters. If you want to calculate your mass, the mass of the protons that make you up, uh, it arises not from the quark masses, which might be zero, but rather from the confined 
uh, kinetic energy of the quarks and of the gluon field that holds them together. Um, the scale, which determines the amount of energy, uh, is simply determined by the size at which the strong force becomes strong. And therefore, uh, in this theory, all masses, which are confined energy, are calculable. All mass ratios are calculable. And by now, <coughs> 50 years later, uh, with powerful computers, lattice gauge theorists can calculate the mass spectrum of hadrons uh, with extraordinary accuracy. We can now calculate the mass difference of the neutron and the proton, the binding energy starting from QCD of the deuteron, uh, and the masses of all these hadrons. If you go to arbitrarily high energies, nothing happens in QCD. The coupling vanishes asymptotically. And this actually explains why gravity is so weak compared to the size of nuclei, or explains why the uh, proton mass is so light compared to the Planck mass, which is the energy scale where gravity becomes strong. Because as you extrapolate, you get to the point where we believe, expect, that all the forces are unified. And if you just assume at this point um, the, for, the nuclear force is of order, you know, some typical small parameter like the electromagnetic force, uh, then it turns out that the ratio of the proton mass to the Planck mass is exponentially small, the inverse of the coupling. And that naturally gives the right order of magnitude to a factor of 100 or 10 or so. In other words, the reason gravity, we are so big compared to the fundamental scale, and also why gravity is so weak at the scale of atoms and nuclei, is that uh, they might have the same equally strong at the basic fundamental scale, but as you go down, to larger distances or lower energies, the uh, scale of the nuclear force increases logarithmically, whereas the scale of the uh, gravitational force decreases uh, like the uh, energy squared or 1 over the distance squared. <coughs> Now, the standard model isn't the answer. Uh, if Feynman was around, he wouldn't be, he'd be working probably on the questions that drive us to, to physics beyond the standard model. And there are a whole bunch of um, issues, the most important of which are uh, driven by experiment, the existence of dark matter as observed by astronomers, neutrino masses that have been measured but not totally understood. They're mixing, which might explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe, why there's matter rather than antimatter, and the cosmic acceleration, which we attribute to the vacuum energy. And from a theoretical point of view, we have other motivations, which are why questions. Uh, for example, unification of the forces, which is called out for in the standard model. Other hierarchies of scales, not just the strong scale, but the electroweak scale. The nature of matter itself and the masses that are, are generated are not understood. And of course, the, a problem that Feynman, too, was obsessed with, as we'll hear in the next talk, of trying to understand the quantum nature of gravity, quantize gravity, and apply our understanding of gravity to cosmology, inflation, and uh, the cosmological constant. What one of these uh, is the, if I had to choose one that I would like to understand, it's probably unification, how the 
three forces that we see in the standard theory, electromagnetism and the weak and strong nuclear forces, are unified. And we strongly suspect that they must be, partly because the ingredients that, uh, of the standard model, which are these three forces, three kinds of charges, one, two, and three, and uh, matter, quarks and leptons, fit together, and this was understood 45 years ago, almost 42 years ago, fit together very neatly into a, um, like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And over the last 40 years, although in intensive searches for new kinds of particles or new forces that would destroy this simple union, uh, haven't been discovered. This, so it need not be the case, but they do fit together as if there's a deeper, you know, they are really one force that looks different at low energy because of a mechanism which we well understand in many parts of physics, uh, which breaks the symmetry, breaks this force into three pieces. And because the forces vary with distance, it's perfectly possible that they have the same strength, the same nature at very high energy. <coughs> and in fact, already 40 years ago, uh, people extrapolated the standard model to very high energy and found that the forces do come together and unify just around the famous Planck scale, a scale we believe is the fundamental scale of physics, defined in terms of the fundamental dimensionful parameters of physics, Planck's constant, the speed of light, and Newton's constant. And that's the point where gravity becomes strong as well. So one of the big motivations after found the formulation of the standard model is to take this clue very seriously uh, and regard it as an indication that all the forces unify with gravity at this extraordinarily, this shouldn't be TV, this should be GV, luckily. <laughs> uh, but a very short distance of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That could be a coincidence. You'd never know in this business, uh, and many of my colleagues, or some of my colleagues, are willing to give up this clue if they have some idea. Mostly, it's, as far as I can see, it's not wor worth giving up this clue yet. So what is the state of particle physics? Well, my opinion, the bottleneck, particle physics is experimental, not theoretical. Easy for me to say. Why? It's that Planck scale, that scale fundamental scale identified by Planck. We theorists have no problem extrapolating, as I just showed, to the Planck scale. And that's because physics scales, as you vary the energy, in some sense, like the log of the energy. So nothing much happens as you scale to these extraordinarily high energies. And we do it all the time, and no, nothing bad happens. Maybe something happens, you get to the Planck scale, because gravity becomes a strong quantum force. But, so we do that. And to a large extent, we've been focused on ideas that come from string theory. But experimentally, to build an accelerator to probe those very high energies or short distances, the difficulties and the costs scale at least like the square of the energy. And experimentalists cannot easily extrapolate even by one order of magnitude. So that's what I call, well, that's a fact of nature. And Feynman stressed, facts are important. Can't do anything about it. We have to learn to live with it. But it really is bothersome. It's what I call the curse of logarithms. Again, physics, scales, Physics here is represented by S, the action. Scales like the log of energy. And on this scale, going from the atom 
to understanding the nucleus, probing the electroweak forces, even the next collider we might build soon, uh, is quite a distance in, in energy. But the scale of gravity, since things are only very logarithmic, is only another step like this. Not so bad. And if this was possible experimentally to probe, I have no doubt that we'd finish the game in less than a century. But the problem is that the cost goes like e to the s, 2s. And on this scale, you know, uh, Fermilab is here. The LHC is here. And the Planck accelerator is about 500 miles down the road. Unimaginable. Well, that's a real, it's a fact of nature and a deep problem for particle physics, for fundamental physics. So the future, well, there are always two options. I tend to be optimistic. You can be pessimistic. And the optimistic scenario, pessimistic scenario is roughly what's happening today, unfortunately. We don't see any, anything rather new or unexpected in the behavior of these Higgs particles recently discovered. We don't see the supersymmetric particles we hope to see. We don't see dark matter anywhere except gravitationally. Uh, no indication of the next threshold. It could be very high. What to do? Build the next accelerator, obviously. We can. It's not that expensive. Uh, and we must do that. What else? The optimistic scenario is that we'll start seeing at the LHC or elsewhere deviations from the standard model. We'll produce supersymmetric particles, say, and we'll detect dark matter. This is perhaps the most immediate challenge, because it's definitely there. And we'll have guidance for the next steps. And there are many proposed next steps. Uh, an extension of the LHC or the Great Collider project in China, uh, which they can certainly afford to do and seem to have the ambition. ambition. But we also need new technology. I mean, if you really extrapolate to these very high energies, um, it looks hopeless. On the other hand, one thing I learned from history is that it's impossible to predict technology and experimental advances. Who would have thought 100 years ago that we could see and manipulate atoms and build materials atom by atom? Uh, there are ideas. Very little money is being devoted to this. Very little effort needs to be done. What about theorists, however? They have an easier task. And perhaps they should follow Einstein's encouragement and warning. Einstein said, the successful attempt to derive delicate laws of nature along a purely mental path by following a belief in the formal unity of the structure of reality encourages continuations in this speculative direction the dangers of which everyone who vividly finds it, follows it, must keep in sight. Well, we all know Einstein tried for most of his life after his great successes and failed. But uh, we have no choice to pursue these clues and to explore theoretically, and that's what Theorists have been doing, mostly using string theory ideas. Um, string theory developed also 50 years ago. This year is now the 50th anniversary of string theory, an old theory arising from probing the properties of quarks bound in flux tubes, which look like strings. And understanding that 
The gauge theories that describe confined quarks look a lot like open strings, strings with quarks at the end. What was amazing in string theory was that uh, when these strings were closed as they had to be, they described the quanta of gravity, gravitons, and that string theory automatically and surprisingly unified the gauge forces that are the basis of the standard theory with gravity. So it's still a possibility that in some sense, the particles we see and the forces arise from superstring theory. Feynman, by the way, didn't like this. Although Caltech was the center of string theory, Feynman was suspicious because those string theorists weren't calculating anything that he cared about. And to quote him, I feel strongly that this is nonsense. So I can entertain future historians or celebrators and his birthday by saying I think all this superstring stuff is crazy and it's in the wrong direction. Uh, I don't like it. They're not calculating anything. What, he was interested, like we all are. What are the masses of the elementary particles, the quarks, all these numbers in the standard model? And these string theorists are so arrogant. They have this unified theory, but they don't calculate anything. <coughs> well, but he knew as well as anyone, and I think Hiroshi will explain, that there were, in addition to calculating all those features of the standard model, which we still can't do in string theory, uh, there are fundamental issues in relativistic quantum mechanics of space-time that need, what ne must be addressed. Uh, the quantum theory of gravity was problematic when you explored very short distances. It seemed that space-time itself fluctuating so dramatically that it made no sense, what we call space-time foam, and that you'd probably have to modify uh, Einstein's theory in some way. Um, situation in string theory is that we still don't exactly know what string theory is, but in the last decades we've discovered, my colleagues have discovered a fantastic duality or relationship between quantum field theory, the basis of the standard model, and string theory, which is related to the duality or the connection in string theory between open strings with ends and closed strings. And that insight, which is called duality, or more technically ADS-CFT, one of its manifestations, relates quantum mechanical, ordinary quantum mechanical systems that are, for example, the standard model, to theories, string theories in higher dimensional spaces. And the famous example of um, the duality is between quantum field theory in four-dimensional flat space with no gravity and string theory in 10 dimensions or five-dimensional hyperbolic space and the de Sitter space. So what really has happened dominated particle theory, or the goal to unify all the forces and understand quantum gravity in the last 20 years, is the exploration of the theory and the connection between quantum field theory and string theory. And it's had enormous um, byproduct. It's given us new insights into the gauge theories of the standard model, into QCD, uh, and its various properties, but also into condensed matter physics, strongly correlated electron systems, uh, and beginning to resolve some of the puzzles of quantum gravity, black holes, 
and it strongly suggests new concepts of space and time. Leading many of us to believe space-time is, is best thought of as an emergent concept, gravity as well. So where are we? Well, we have this incredible framework in which the standard model traditionally was formulated. Standard model is a quantum field theory of matter. And then we have this string theory, which was started out as a theory of quantized extended objects. And we've learned that they're the same thing, different, different versions or ways of looking at the same physics. And that the framework of theoretical physics at the bottom is, we have no idea. It contains at least strings, fields, and who knows what. And for decades now, we've been exploring, theoretically exploring this framework. It has a solid foundation, of course, in the end connection to experiment, uh, which we can use and apply the standard theory, the standard model. But we still have absolutely no idea what picks out the particular theory from the framework of all possible quantum field theories. That's what Feynman wanted to know, what fixes those parameters in the standard model. And we still have no idea. But at the stage we're at, in the example of um, QCD is a perfect theory. We're asking a lot now. Feynman was asking a lot. What fixes the particular dynamics? What picks the uh, standard model out of this whole framework? We're also asking what fixes the initial and final state of the universe. And in fact, I have a suspicion that these are related. So in particle physics, we'd like to unify the forces, and we'd like to understand why all those parameters are what they are, the forces are what they are, and so on. The uniqueness of a particular theory out of the enormous framework. But I suspect that that might be, that question, its answer, might be related to Another question we're beginning to ask, which is how did the universe begin? Maybe how it ended. Because now we are, cosmologists are faced with that problem. And as theoretical physicists, uh, we too are being forced to contemplate questions like how did the universe begin? And this is natural because Einstein taught us that Gravity is the dynamics of space-time. So the universe is the history of space-time, which includes the beginning and the end. And here, again, this is a very outrageous goal, but it is now being addressed scientifically. And any solution to the unification of all the forces with gravity among the rest should give a consistent history of cosmology, consistent history of the universe, including the beginning and the end. Now, all of our multiple candidates for theories in the framework of string slash field theory so far are break down if we go to the beginning of time, beginning of the universe. So these problems might very well be related, but they're extraordinarily difficult. And they're made even more difficult because our most fundamental concept, that of space-time, is itself being threatened as we probe the quantum nature of dynamical space-time of quantum gravity. So that's where we are. We are asking, very difficult questions. We're not yet at the point where we can calculate, and we might not be until we uh, begin to understand the framework uh, 
this enormous framework of strings and fields that uh, might uh, give us a consistent history of the universe and pick out a unique dynamics from this marvelous framework. So we have a wonderful theory of elementary particles. Feynman would have been happy to see uh, and celebrate its successes. But the most important questions remain to be answered. We do have fantastic experiments and instruments and even more fantastic speculations. So the best is yet to come. Thank you. So thank you, David, for that uh, beautiful talk. I think we have time for just maybe one or two questions. I think there are some microphones set up if um, people would like to come and ask. Uh, we don't, we're running a little bit late, but um, I think we could maybe handle one or two. <clears throat> Takers? Uh, I think there's microphones, if you can line up, I should say. There's microphones on either side of this. Yes, please. So uh, one of the hot topics in public press these days about physics is the question of time. Uh, <laughs> a number of books have come out about it, uh, including um, some from Sean Carroll and here at Caltech. What are, what are your thoughts about time, and um, and is it you know what do you, what do you think about that subject? Oh, boy, uh, I could I could talk for a long time uh, <laughs> about that about time. It um, so we many of us are convinced that space time unified is an emergent concept. Uh, that, of course, is really difficult to imagine for time. So how could you formulate physics without time? Um, time has many, many mysteries. Um, some we understand roughly, like the arrow of time. But why it correlates with the arrow of the cosmological expansion is a mystery that goes back to the initial conditions, which we, I think, are beginning to have to address. There are many features of time that are truly mysterious, like the concept of now. I mean, in physics, physicists know that there's no such thing as now in, in the equations we use to describe physical reality, and yet we all feel that there's a now, it's just past, and it's now in the past. And a new now is coming very shortly from the future, and we're moving, and, but this doesn't, is not in accord with our equations or our theories. So it's an illusion, but how, how that works out is partly a problem of understanding the human mind, but also the physical universe. So time is the most interesting of all of our physical um, concepts. And uh, as many, there are many mysteries. Um, the nice thing about it, although, you know, this is that in addition to a lot of the philosophizing and uh, books you're talking about, we're now in, some of us are able, with the help of these uh, very specific um, understanding of this framework of strings and fields are able to begin to address some of those issues the way Feynman liked to do it with calculations and equations and not just words. But it, it's, it's the most mysterious of all of our concepts.